All right. Ford v Ferrari is one of the best films of the year, courtesy of the director of Logan. The movie raced its way to the top of the box office thanks to its impressive cast and the allure of learning about the figures behind building an iconic car. Despite being about real people and real events, there are of course creative liberties that had to be taken to make the movie more enjoyable for the audiences. So let's break down what's fact and fiction in this movie. If you're one of the people who never saw Ford v Ferrari and are wondering what it is we're even talking about, well, let us fill you in. The movie stars Matt Damon and Christian Bale as Carol Shelby and Ken Miles, respectively. Both men are real people who helped the Ford Motor Company break out of a certain image that it had obtained after the war and create one of the most competitive racing cars in the sport. The race itself is a monster. Unlike most races, which feature a predetermined amount of laps that the cars have to circulate in order to win, the race featured in the movie doesn't play by those rules. The race, located at Le Mans in France, is an endurance race and sees the teams racing for 24 hours straight. Two drivers share one car over the course of the day and they have to maintain speed, gas, wear and tear, sleep deprivation, food and other factors while trying to do the most laps throughout the day. The race is not for the faint of heart, that's for certain. The movie shows us that the suits at Ford wanted to try something new to win over the minds and wallets of young drivers, so the company decided that it would produce a racing car, and one that would be ready to take names at Le Mans, a circuit that was dominated by Ferrari up until that point. Ford hired Matt Damon's Carroll Shelby, the only American to win at Le Mans at that point, to help engineer a car. On the other end of the spectrum was Ken Miles. It's high risk. No high risk. Extremely high risk. A British racing driver, played by Christian Bale in an award-worthy performance, Miles is the kind of guy who lives, breathes, and understands cars better than most people on the planet. He also doesn't like to play by the rules of others, making him a bit of a wild card and a reckless individual in the eyes of the Ford Motor Company. Happy Bill! These two would be the most important figures in creating a car that would go to Le Mans. Despite the setup and the rich history involved with the creation of the Ford GT40, there had to be some creative liberties taken to make a cohesive and entertaining movie. In fact, Ford vs Ferrari plays it pretty fast and loose with historical accuracy in the name of making a great movie. We'll start with something small and then go from there. The point that we're going to start off with involves a pep talk that Matt Damon's Carroll Shelby gives in the 1960s, where he promised that, quote, we're going to make history, end quote. Now, there's no evidence Shelby ever said this back in the 60s, but we know for certain that he did say those exact words back in 2008. This was when Shelby America and Ford teamed up yet again for the circuits, the first time the two companies partnered up since 1969. The moment was so momentous for the company and so well documented that the speech seemed perfectly used in the context of the 1960s conquest at Le Mans. Since the movie only focuses on the events leading up to the 1966 Le Mans, the movie never explains that Carroll Shelby parted ways with Ford in 1969 to work with Dodge after financial and creative differences. In order to streamline the focus on Shelby and Ken Miles, the film had to cut certain characters and events out of the narrative. One of those characters was the driver of the Ford GT in 1964 and 1965, John Wire, nicknamed Pappy. He was Shelby's boss when he was racing at Aston Martin, per the film's opening, and regularly got into heated arguments with the suits at Ford, particularly Leo Beebe. In the movie Ford v Ferrari, Matt Damon's Carroll Shelby is often seen duking it out and entering disagreements with the very corporate-minded Leo Beebe. The movie, of course, made the conflict with Beebe a lot more tenuous on the big screen, and who could blame him? Josh Lucas's portrayal of Leo Beebe is one of the douchiest characters of the year, so the writers likely wanted to make us really not want to root for BB at all. So scenarios like BB being locked in the office while Shelby took Henry Ford second out in the Ford GT and convinced him to hire Ken Miles didn't happen. This comes courtesy of journalist Frank Comstock, a former student of Leo BB, so perhaps there's a bias there with the source. BB did think Ken Miles was a loose cannon due to the risks that he took at the 12 hour Sebring race, but it was never so bad that Carroll Shelby had to bet his career on Ken. In the film, BB and the Ford team didn't want to push the cars too far and lock them in at 6,000 RPM, which Damon's Shelby ultimately can, realizing that BB may have been setting up Ken to lose in order to make a point. Shelby made an executive decision in the film and walked to the edge of the racing track with a sign that read 7,000 plus go like hell, which allowed Ken to fully open the car up. Despite having the need for speed, there was one stunt that never did occur in real life, and it actually had nothing to do with the cars. In the movie, 
Carol Shelby asks to take hold of an airplane and land it at a Ford event for the top brass on board. Despite being a trained pilot, Shelby never pulled this stunt. He was on the ground during the Ford Mustang GT350 reveal event. But the movie also sticks with the facts. One such instance is the entire motivation of the Ford Motor Company in wanting to pursue racing. The film depicts the company desperately trying to change its image and become cool in the eyes of the public. We need to think like Ferrari. A way to gain that trust and that appeal were to win one of the most prestigious motor races in the world, something that they believed as being a shortcut to success, as it were. When a race, people will suddenly see Ford as the American James Bond. Ford wasn't being cheap when it came to developing the Ford GT40. The reason for this is directly Ferrari's fault. In the early days of the development, Ford actually wanted to partner with Ferrari, who were bankrupt at the time. They proposed a merger, with Ford Ferrari being the consumer company and Ferrari Ford being the racing company. Ferrari rejected this deal and proceeded to take a more lucrative deal with Fiat, a deal that saw Enzo Ferrari retain control of his company, something Ford couldn't guarantee. In real life, Henry Ford II declared, we're going to race them, which is a lot more civilized than what the character said in the film, which to paraphrase a bit was, we're going to bury that greasy Italian. Only he didn't say Italian. But the film made it seem like John Barenthal's Lee Iacocca, vice president of Ford, was heavily involved with trying to get Ferrari to merge with Ford. In reality, many of the meetings and negotiating between the companies were done by Iacocca's engineer subordinate, Don Frey. Apparently, Frey's charm and knowledge of cars almost won Ferrari over, and Enzo even got around to calling him Dottore Engineer. Good chance we butchered that, but hey, it means Dr. Engineer. In the end, though, it wasn't meant to be. What was meant to be, however, was that the Ford GT40 was to have removable brakes at Le Mans 1966. One of the biggest issues the car had was that the brakes would overheat due to the speeds and would burn out long before the race had concluded. The team working on the car, specifically Phil Remington, played by Ray McKinnon in the movie, came up with the idea of installing removable brakes in the car. Why wasn't everyone doing this? The rules at Le Mans were a little vague, and all the teams seemed to understand that changing the brakes was an illegal practice and would result in their car being disqualified. But upon reflecting upon the meaning of the rules, it occurred to the team that the brakes are considered a part, and thus, they could remove it at any time in the race, allowing the GT40 to continue racing on fresh brakes many hours into the event. The team also taped pieces of yarn on the early models of the GT40 in order to test how the air gets circulated through the car. The air duct on the car before was costing them up to 76 horsepower, so you bet they wanted to fix that quickly. Despite all the engineering minds, yarn was the solution to this problem. Another thing that happened was Ken Miles' door refusing to close at Le Mans 1966, but we don't know if a hammer resulted in it being closed. So we've talked about the major events and subtle quirks, but what about Shelby and Miles themselves? How were they represented on the big screen versus their real life counterparts? The movie makes the relationship between Miles and Shelby seem a little more contentious than it was in real life. The real Carol Shelby stated that he got along really well with Ken Miles. Because of that, the grocery fight that the two men got into likely didn't happen, but it certainly was a funny scene. In reality, Shelby had this to say about Miles, courtesy of his biography. Quote, All those years before Shelby American, we knew him as kind of a hothead, but it never showed up during the years he was with me. It seemed like he created a hell of a lot of controversy before he came to work with me at Shelby American, but I always got along with Ken just fine. End quote. Now in real life, all three Ford GT40s at Le Mans 1966 crossed the finish line at the same time. A decision that saw the clear winner, Ken Miles, get bumped to second place. Now don't forget, the winner at Le Mans is granted on the distance covered, not being the first over the line. The film makes this seem like Leo Beebe was out to take the win away from Ken Miles, but the real Leo has his own take on the situation. He stated that, even with Ken in the lead, the other two Ford GT drivers were gunning for first despite the gap between them and Miles. This desire to win could have caused reckless and dangerous driving, so BB asked Miles to slow down in order to make sure the other two drivers crossed the line safely. To quote BB himself, I had some real difficulties over that, BB said. He was a daredevil, and I pulled him in and literally engineered the end of that race. 
One, two, three. I called Ken Miles in and held him back because I was afraid the drivers would knock one another off. All you need is one good accident and you'll lose all your investment. When it comes to the portrayal of Ken Miles in the movie, this is the aspect that seems fairly unchanged in the bigger picture. The movie was ultimately a PG-13 run and played it pretty safe with adult content, which explains why they didn't include what Miles really said when he saw he was given second place at Le Mans, which was, I think I've been beep. One fact that changed was the manner of his death. Both in the film and in real life, Miles tragically lost his life while testing a J car at Riverside Raceway on August 16th, 1966. The difference is the manner of his death. A theme in the movie was dying due to being trapped in the car, which would result in burning or suffocation. It was something that Miles' son, Peter, was terrified of after seeing Ken get into a similar accident earlier in the film. In reality, Ken was thrown from his car and died due to the impact. While it's not a huge change, there's a symmetry that fits better and foreshadows Ken's untimely demise earlier on in the film. The film did accurately showcase how the death of Ken affected Shelby. What did you think of this racing feature? Are you a motorsport fan and want to see more car movies on the big screen that aren't Fast and Furious films? Let us know what you think in the comments below and be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in your playlist every day. Thanks for watching.